So today, we're going to pick up pretty much right where we left off. I'm going to remind you of just a few concepts. We're trying to understand the electronic absorption spectrum of an octahedral D2 ion, the prototype of which is hexaqua vanadium trication. Okay. We, we said that we couldn't use just the molecular orbital diagram to understand the electronic spectrum because the electronic spectrum shows three D to D transitions spaced throughout the, the UV invisible region. The molecular orbital diagram makes you think there would only be one. And so to address this problem, we're applying crystal field theory and we're going all the way back to the free ion, that is a vanadium three plus ion with two D electrons in a spherical electric field. And to treat this, we have to, to deal with the concept of microstates, that there are 45 different ways you can put two electrons into that spherical vanadium three plus ion. We haven't gotten to these yet, but then we're going to take those microstates and collect them into an atomic state, which is a collection of microstates that have the same energy. The problem comes about because specific combinations of orbital occupation and spin have lower energy than others, okay? And we're going to collect those microstates that have the same energy into atomic states, and then we assign a term symbol that really gives you all the information you need to know about that atomic state. Now, the term symbol is characterized by multi-electron quantum numbers. We keep it simple and use capital letters equivalent to the ones that you know for single electron quantum numbers. So capital L gives you the total orbital angular momentum of the atomic state. Remember, the atomic state is the collection of microstates. That total angular momentum of the atomic state is going to be given by the maximum M sub L, capital M sub L value of a microstate, okay? And so in a given atomic state, you're going to have M sub L values that range from plus capital L all the way to minus capital L. We also have the total spin angular momentum quantum number for the atomic state that we use capital S. That again similarly gives us the maximum value of the capital M sub S value for a microstate, okay? Again, there are certain allowances for the value of M sub S and the val based on the value of L, just like we know there are for the quantum, uh, the one electron quantum numbers. So you'll recall that we left off with this glorious table last time where we went through and we defined how we were going to do the bookkeeping on each of these 45 different microstates. It's incredibly tedious. We all know it, okay? I, I don't have to explain that to you. But this, the picture is simple. If we have our 5D orbitals that have little M sub L values that range from minus 2 to plus 2, for instance, we can put two electrons in that M sub L plus 2 orbital. They, one has to go and spin up, one has to go spin down. And so we use a shorthand notation, 2 superscript plus, 2 superscript minus, to indicate that both electrons are in that M, little m sub L plus 2 orbital, and they have opposite spin. One is spin up, one is spin down. And in our microstate table, that entry, that microstate goes where capital M sub L is equal to plus 4, 2 plus 2, and capital M sub S is equal to 0 because plus, a, plus 1 and minus 1 is equal to 0, or really plus 1 half and minus 1 half is equal to 0. And of course, we can fill out the whole table doing all the different microstates. Again, Incredibly tedious, but really not hard, okay? We can all draw arrows in boxes and count up the numbers and pluses or minuses. The trick now that we have all 45 microstates is to figure out how they split into atomic states, which combinations have the same energies. And so it turns out that, again, 
just like the process of generating all the microstates, at this point the process of filtering them into atomic states is not hard, but it's tedious. What we have to do is we, we know that we're going to assign atomic states and give them term symbols. The term symbol is defined by the two quantum numbers, capital S and capital L. Capital L, the total orbital angular momentum of the atomic state, is given by the maximum value of m sub L for the collection of microstates. Okay, so real easy to, to start defining the first atomic state. You just look at your table and look for the microstate with the maximum value of capital M sub L. That's this one over here on the right hand side of the table. There's only one microstate that has a capital M sub L value of four and as we said that must have a capital M sub S value of zero because there's only one way to put two electrons in a single orbital. So for this atomic state that has a capital L value of four, we can only have M sub S values of zero. Okay, remember because these two spots are blocked out, we can only have an M sub S value of zero. So if we define L is equal to four and S is equal to zero, you can go to that table on the first slide and define the term symbol for the first atomic state. It's what we call a singlet G. Okay, singlet because the spin multiplicity is 2s plus 1. If s is 0, the spin multiplicity is 1. g because g is what we use for capital L equal to 4. Now we said a few slides ago that if you have L is equal to 4, then your atomic state is going to contain M sub L values that range from plus L all the way to minus L. So that means you're going to have a microstate with L is equal to 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4. So you're going to have nine different M sub L values in this singlet G atomic state. For M sub S values, it's a similar concept. M sub S for the atomic state is going to run from plus S all the way to minus S, but in this case that's trivial, right? If S is equal to zero, then we're going to go from plus zero to minus zero, which means only M sub S values of zero are going to be, only microstates with M sub S equal to zero can be in this atomic state. So what we're going to do, this is, we decided this is one of the microstates that goes into our atomic state. It's really the one that helps define it. And now we're just going to go through and we're going to remove one microstate from each of these blocks in the middle row of the microstate table. Does it matter which one? Yes and no. Okay. Yes, of course it matters which one. At this point, we're just doing bookkeeping, so you can take out whichever one you want. Okay? The actual quantum numbers that we're using make it a little confusing to get the d orbitals that we were familiar with. So at this point, as long as you only take one microstate out of each block in this middle row, you'll be fine. And so those nine microstates are collected, they all have exactly the same energy, and they make up the singlet G atomic state. Okay, so when we fully remove those nine microstates, you'll see that now we're left with a more regular shaped set of microstates. Our M, capital M sub L value, the maximum value on the table is plus three. That right away tells us that we have the next atomic state 
with a term symbol of F. But in this case, with capital M sub L is equal to 3, we can have capital M sub S values of plus 1, 0, or minus 1. So for S equals 1, we have a multi spin multiplicity of 3. So this is a triplet F atomic state. Again, in this triplet F atomic state, we're going to have M sub L values that range from plus 3 to minus 3. And we're going to have capital M sub S values that range from plus 1 to minus 1. So that tells you that one microstate from every box that's populated is going to be part of this triplet F atomic state. That's a lot, right? So 21 microstates make up the triplet F. Again, at this point, it doesn't matter which microstate you take off the table. Just make sure it's one from each box. OK, so what's the next atomic state going to be? Yeah, you look on the table, you say, what's the maximum M sub L value? plus 2. That tells us that the term symbol for this next atomic state is going to be a capital D. Based on the microstates that are left, for that L equal 2 atomic state, you can only have one possible spin multiplicity, and that's 0. Right? Because based on the, uh, the microstates that are left, all you can have is plus or minus 0 for the M sub S value. So that tells us the third atomic state is a singlet D. Again, capital M sub L will go from plus 2 to minus 2. Capital M sub S can only be 0. So this microstate has five, or sorry, this atomic state has five different microstates. They come out only from this middle row where M sub S is equal to zero. I will point out, I know you guys are thinking this is confusing, tedious, all, you don't really see where it's going. We'll get there. But it's also D2 and D3 are pretty much the hardest ones to do. Um, so D1 is trivial, D5 is trivial, 6, 7, 8, 9 are all just derivatives of 1, 2, 3, and 4. So. OK, we're just going to keep going through our method. We have a maximum M sub L value now of plus 1. That tells us the second to last term symbol is going to be a capital P. Again, we have M sub S values that can range from plus 1 to minus 1. So it's a triplet atomic state. And it's going to contain nine different microstates one from each box that's still populated. And we can take that out and we have one lonely old microstate left that's going to be its own atomic state. It's got an M sub L value of zero and an M sub S value of zero, so it's a singlet S. So we had 45 microstates. We've now factored them into five different atomic states, OK? One of those, oops, darn it, OK, that's fine. One of those microstates was in singlet S. 
Nine microstates were in triplet P, seven were in singlet D, 21 were in triplet F, and nine were in singlet G. So we can determine which one of these states is the lowest in energy by applying simple freshman chemistry type rules. So the ground state is going to have this highest spin multiplicity because we're, we maximize the exchange interaction and we minimize Coulombic repulsion, right? What we're saying is we're optimizing electron-electron repulsion, okay? That's what you do when you apply Hund's rule. Okay, we didn't tell you that in freshman chemistry, but you're optimizing the exchange in Coulombic repulsion. So the ground state will either be the triplet F or the triplet P because that's when you have both electrons, the two electrons unpaired, spin up, spin up. To decide whether the triplet F or the triplet P is the lowest in energy, you pick the ground state with the largest value for L. In other words, we're going to, the lowest energy atomic state is going to be the one that has the greatest number of microstates. Boltzmann wins again. Okay? It's got the highest degeneracy. It's got the highest degree of entropy. So that tells us that the ground state the lowest energy electron configuration, or the lowest collection of microstates, is going to be triplet F. That's for the free ion. That's our vanadium 3 plus floating around in space with no ligands on it in a completely spherical electric field. The other four states, the singlet G, the singlet D, the triplet P, and the singlet S, are excited state electron configurations. So if you go to table 11.5 in your text, it lists the atomic states for all the different possible D electron counts. Okay, and you'll see for D2 that you get exactly this list of atomic states. Your textbook has done the work for you and it'll give you the atomic states for any other D electron configuration. Of course, you can also derive it. Like I said, it's not hard, it's just tedious. Okay, we're gonna take a small pause here in, our, in, our pro, in the problem of actually solving this D2 ion to bring up another concept, and this is really going to be the only time we talk about it uh, in this class, but it's spin orbit coupling. And so, again, spin-orbit coupling is, is complicated. Um, it's, it applies more to heavy elements in the periodic table than it does to light elements. But the premise is pretty simple, okay? If you have an electron, it's charged, it's spinning, it's going to have an electric and magnetic vector, okay? You also have that electron and it's moving in an orbital. That's going to generate a different electric dipole and a different magnetic dipole. Those dipoles can couple together in certain ways that result in lower energy. And so for heavier elements in the periodic table, and especially the F elements, so write that, those orphaned elements down at the bottom that nobody knows what to do with and they all have funny names. Um, that's where this spin-orbit coupling becomes very, very important. To deal with it, we come up with another quantum number, capital J, which is the total orbital or the total angular momentum. It combines both the orbital angular momentum and the spin angular momentum, and it's simply defined as capital L plus capital S, and it can take on values from L plus S to L minus S. And so if we consider spin orbit coupling for our D2 ion, we can predict that we have three different J values, okay? 
L plus S for the triplet F ground state is going to be 4, right? Remember we said that the, the S value is 1 and the L value is 3. I'm pretty sure that's still 4. The minimum value is going to be 4, or sorry, 3 minus 1, which is 2. And so now J is going to take on values of 4, 3, and 2. Now, of course, if we just said that the triplet F is the ground state, but this spin orbit coupling idea will basically split that triplet F into three different spin orbit states, okay? We can then ask which one of those is going to be lowest in energy. And this is where it becomes fun. If your shell is less than half filled, the lowest J value gives the lowest energy. If your shell is more than half filled, the highest J gives the lowest energy. And for a half filled shell, only one J is possible, okay? So obviously, in this case, we can rule out three because we have more than one J value. So we just have to decide, is a D2 ion a case where the orbital is more than half filled or less than half filled? Well, since the D orbitals can hold 10 electrons, two is less than half of 10. And so the lowest J gives the lowest energy. So in this case, the triplet F2 would be considered the lowest energy spin orbit state of the D2 ion. But again, for an ion like vanadium, that's probably not incredibly important because it's considered to be one of the lighter metals. Okay, back to the real problem at hand. We set out to understand why the optical absorption spectrum of hexaquavanadium has three electronic transitions. Based on the intensity and their position, we know that those are all D to D transitions. Yet from our molecular orbital diagram, it looks like there should only be one. So we've spent the last the last half of, the, of Friday's lecture and the first half of today's lecture analyzing the D2 free ion, no ligands, spherical symmetry. That gives us five equal energy D orbitals and we said 45 different microstates that we separated out into five atomic states. Of those five atomic states, we said that triplet F is the ground state. Now, a word of caution, we use these, the, we really used Hund's rules to define that triplet F was the ground state. You cannot use those rules to determine the ordering of the excited states, okay? It only gives you the ground state. The calculation to predict the rest are much, much more difficult. It's the ground state because it maximizes spin multiplicity and then it maximizes orbital angular momentum. We basically end up with the, uh, the atomic state that has the highest um, degeneracy. So now we go back to our rules for spectroscopy. Spin allowed transitions occur between states with the same spin multiplicity. Laporte allowed transitions occur between orbitals with different parity. In the absorption spectrum for the hexaqua vanadium, all of the extinction coefficients were in the range that told us we're dealing with spin allowed Laporte forbidden transitions. Okay, in other words, spin allowed D to D transitions. Okay, D to D bit transitions are Laporte forbidden, but they can still be spin allowed. So if we're dealing with only spin allowed transitions and the ground state is triplet F, then the only atomic state that's viable as an excited state is the triplet P. Okay. 
Okay, so if you're staying with me, and I know it's kind of hard because you're not really sure where we're going yet, but if you're staying with me, we just did a whole bunch of tedious, ridiculous identifying of microstates and filtering them into atomic states, and then came down and said, there's only two important atomic states, the triplet F and the triplet P. And I still don't really get how one ground state and one excited state can lead to three different transitions. The problem is, at this point, we still haven't dealt with those pesky ligands. Okay? The triplet F and the triplet P are the atomic states in spherical symmetry. Now we have to go back and go into octahedral symmetry and bring in those water ligands. And so this is where the actual identity of the microstates becomes important. We said that the triplet F has 21 microstates. You can go through and actually predict what these microstates look like. Okay, we're not going to use quantum numbers. Now we're going to use the cartoon pictures of the orbitals. We can put one electron in this dxy orbital, one electron in the dxz. We can do the xy and the yz. We can do the yz and the xz. We can put an electron in xy and z squared. We can put an electron in xz and x squared minus y squared. We can put an electron in yz and x squared minus y squared. Or we can put an electron in x squared minus y squared and dz squared. Now you can look at these. You can say, OK, that's 7, right? You said there's 21. So where, what are the other 14? I'll remind you that when we define the atomic states, we picked a microstate in the, for the, we take a microstate with m sub s is equal to plus 1, 0, and minus 1. So for each orbital combination, here, there's a microstate with both electrons up, a microstate with one up, one down, and a microstate with both down. So for each one of these, there's three different spin combinations. That gives you a total of 21 microstates. Now the thing about these specific seven orbital combinations are that it puts the electrons as far apart as possible on the vanadium ion. And so what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about this first one, putting an electron into dxy and an electron into, what did we say? That's xz. One electron is in the xy plane, and one electron is in the xz plane. If you're going to put two electrons on one ion, that's as far apart as you're going to get them. They're occupying different planes of space. And you can go through and convince yourself that all seven of these combinations put the electron in different planes. Okay, it's obviously on the same ion, but on that ion, it's as far apart as it can get. That distance, if you want to think about it, or that localization of the electrons in different planes is what differentiates the triplet F from the triplet P. So the triplet P has nine microstates. And we can draw out the orbital combinations for these as well. And now you'll notice that the electrons are effectively much closer. So that first combination puts an electron in the dxy orbital and the second electron in dx squared minus y squared. Now you have two electrons in the xy plane. 
Yes, they're in different orbitals, but they're in the same plane. And so that's closer together. For the yz and the z squared, both electrons are in the same plane. Same thing here. So for these three orbital combinations, you're going to have a higher degree of electron-electron repulsion because you're trying to hold the electrons in the same plane of the molecule. Again, for each of these three orbital combinations, you'll have this one, this one, and this one. So three different spin, three different m sub s values to give you the total of nine different microstates. Okay, so in a spherical D2 ion, the only difference between the triplet F and the triplet P atomic states is electron-electron repulsion. Okay, because otherwise the D orbitals are all at the same energy. And so we can come back to our MO diagram type picture and be clear about what we're saying at this point. For the vanadium 3 plus in a spherical field, all five d orbitals are at the same energy. If we now go to the atomic states, the ground state is a triplet F. We have an excited state that's a triplet P. And this energy separation is defined as 15b. Now, what the heck is b? Have you guys talked about Raka parameters in PCHEM yet? Okay. It's a fancy quantum mechanical term for electron-electron repulsion. Okay. There's three different Raka parameters. We're not going to go into them. It's beyond the scope of this course. For our purposes, we'll just know that this is 15b. It's effectively the electron repulsion term for trying to put two electrons in the same plane of the D2 ion. Now, if you're curious, I've also put the singlet electronic states on the same energy scale. So you can see that the singlet D is actually lower in energy than the triplet P, but we can't observe it. That transition from the triplet F to the singlet D is spin forbidden. It's spin forbidden, it's orbital forbidden, it just doesn't happen. Okay, it's, you know, it's like Gary, Indiana, right? Yes, technically you could go there, but who would want to? So nobody ever goes from LA to Gary, Indiana, okay? Even though it's closer than New York City. Yeah. Well, because when we do all 45 microstates, I mean, it exists. It's a real state. You can access it in fancy ways. Okay, it's just doing conventional spectroscopy. It's an it's a particular electron configuration that's quantum mechanically not accessible doing conventional spectroscopy. Conventional spectroscopy, we only can see these two states. We also miss out on the singlet G and the singlet S, which are at significantly higher energies. OK, so the question that we're left with in a spherical field, it's kind of the simplest case. All five of our d elect orbitals are at the exact same energy. We know that if we bring in an octahedral ligand field, that the d orbitals are not at the same energy anymore. The dxy, the dxz, and the dyz make up the T2g set that are non-bonding dz squared and dx squared minus y squared become antibonding. They go up in energy. 
So if these atomic states describe the energy of specific microstate electron configurations, those specific microstates, those specific electron configurations are going to have different energies when the ligand field is imposed. When you suddenly push dz squared higher in energy, any microstate that includes dz squared is going to change in energy. So we can go back to our pictures here because we assigned exactly which orbital combinations we're going to make up the triplet F and the triplet P atomic states. And because we sketched out these pictures, we can use our knowledge of ligand field theory to predict how these atomic states will split when we go from spherical to octahedral symmetry. What we're really doing here is we're descending in symmetry. Right? When you have spherical symmetry, you're, you're in the highest symmetry possible. All the d orbitals are equivalent. When we drop to octahedral, we're lowering the symmetry, and all of a sudden, all five d orbitals are not equivalent. They group into three and two. Okay, so we're breaking the symmetry. We can just look at these pictures. If we think about this first one in the top left, well, that's the dxy orbital. It's part of the T2g set in an octahedron. So is that xz. xy and yz are all in the T2g set. So are both of those. So for these three orbital combinations, both electrons reside in an orbital of T, it's T2g, non-bonding. If we come over to the second column, the first orbital is T2g, but oh, there's dz squared. That remember in an octahedron is an anti-bonding orbital. It gets pushed up in energy. Same thing here. xz and x squared minus y squared, yz and x squared minus y squared. So this second column of triplet F microstates, you can think about it as being a T2g1 EG1 electron configuration. That didn't matter in the spherical ion because all the orbitals were the same. But in an octahedron, where you have one of them is bonding or non-bonding and one of them is anti-bonding, that matters. What do we have out here? Well, that's x squared minus y squared, that's z squared. Both of these are EG orbitals. So effectively, this specific microstate of the triplet F atomic state is putting two electrons up in the antibonding orbitals. OK. So we said that because it's triplet F, well, step back. The energy of a microstate as we impose the octahedral field is going to be defined by two things, electron-electron repulsions and the energy of the ligand field. We said that we can account for the electron-electron repulsion using these rock parameters. For D2, we said it was 15B between the triplet F and the triplet P. We also know how to account for the ligand field. Right. Remember, we said that the gap between T2G and EG is delta O. So for these three microstate combinations, the energy is going to be 0B because there's no electron repulsion. They're in, op they're in different planes. And 0 delta O because both electrons are in T2G orbitals. For this second column, 
the electron repulsion term is still zero because the electrons are in different planes. But the crystal field term or the ligand field term is one delta O because one electron is in T2G and one electron has been put up into EG. For this last one, the electrons are in different planes, so the electron, electron repulsion is zero, but we have a ligand field energy of two delta O because we've put both electrons up into the EG orbital. What happens here? It's dxy, x squared minus y squared. That's a non-bonding orbital in an octahedron. That's an anti-bonding orbital in an octahedron. Same thing there and there. So for the triplet P, we can assign an energy as well. The energy of this triplet P when we impose the octahedral field is now going to be 15B plus 1 delta O. 15B because there's one, both electrons are in the same plane of the molecule. One delta O because one electron is a non-bonding orbital and one is in the EG anti-bonding orbital. Yeah? So that's the dx squared minus y squared orbital, which in octahedral symmetry is metal ligand antibonding. That's dz squared, which in octahedral symmetry is metal ligand antibonding. The separation between the non-bonding and antibonding orbitals is delta O. So if we put both electrons in the antibonding orbitals, it's two times the separation, or two times delta O. Anybody else? Any? Okay, so let's see what this looks like when we plot it out. Here again is our free ion. All five d orbitals of the same energy. Triplet f ground state, triplet p excited state. We've grayed out the singlet states because we don't care. They're not important. They're all Gary, Indiana. Now we're going to impose the octahedral ligand field. The approach that we're taking is what's known as the weak field limit approach. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to impose octahedral symmetry, but we're going to impose it so that the magnitude of delta O is approximately zero or some very, very small number, okay? So in other words, the gap between T2G and EG is, it's there, but it's, it's so small that it kind of doesn't count. But just by imposing the octahedral symmetry, we've broken the degeneracy. DZ squared is no longer at the same energy as DXY because they're, they make up different irreducible representations of the octahedron. We're going to take that weak field limit and then take it to the strong field limit where delta O is large. Now dz squared and dx squared minus y squared are pushed up much higher in energy than the T2G non-bonding orbitals. So how does this play out? In the weak field limit, we take this triplet F ground state, and as we showed on the last slide, it splits into three different states, three different electron configurations. It splits into a triplet T1G, that triplet T1G puts both electrons in the T2G level.
it gives us a triplet T2G. That puts one electron here and one electron up in the EG. Finally, it gives us the triplet A1G. Remember there was only one microstate that made up the triplet A1G and that's where both electrons are in the EG orbitals. For the triplet P, we said that there's only one combination. It comes across as the triplet T2G, and it means there's one electron in the non-bonding orbital and one in the anti-bonding orbital. But because delta O is so small, you'll notice that these three states are still clustered together, much lower in energy than this triplet T2G because electron pairing energy is much larger than delta O. Now what happens as we increase the strength of the ligand field? You have no idea how long it took me to do that. <laughs> Okay, well, this bottom state, triplet T1G, we said that state is with both electrons here. It doesn't matter if we increase the strength of the, the ligand field. There's no delta O term in it because both electrons are in the non-bonding orbital. So it, more or less, it comes across and stays as the ground state. This second level, we said, had one electron here and one electron here. So as delta O increases, the energy of that triplet T2G has to go up in a one-for-one -one correspondence. What about that one? That was that triplet A1G. Well, that triplet A1G puts both electrons here. Sorry, I'm not tall enough. If both electrons are here, they're both populating the antibonding orbital. As delta O goes up, the energy of this triplet A1G has to go up twice as fast. Now for this you'll notice that I just brought the triplet P straight across. Technically it's going up in energy because it includes one delta O component. But an important thing happens. In the strong field limit, we define the strong field limit as the case where delta O is much larger than the pairing energy. If delta O is, is much larger than the pairing energy, then these two essentially become equivalent in energy. Because remember, the difference here is just this 15B. So if delta O is much larger than 15B, then those two states will be at about the same energy. We're done, right? That's it. It's obvious, right? No, I didn't mean we're done, get out. <laughs> Though we are just about done. But there it is, right? We started out with the D2I and we wondered how the heck we had three transitions. One, two, three. So when we take into account the specific electron configurations, electron-electron repulsions, and the ligand field, suddenly it becomes obvious why we have three different optical transitions. This is where we'll pick up on Wednesday and we'll come up with a new way to look at this data. Have a great day.